So the title of the book, um, the, the Presence of the Future, this was written by a man named George Eldon Ladd, who was a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. I don't know if any of you remember, but Peter Wagner was also a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. That's how I heard about this man, George Eldon Ladd, was through Peter Wagner. But he was a mentor of mine, and another, uh, well, we'll talk about a little bit more, but in the summary, when you go on Amazon, if you want to buy the book, it says the, the things that he discusses as bullet points are the promises of the kingdom, which I'll tell you are, are spelled out in the Old Testament. The prophets said there would be a Messiah coming, right? So the promise of the kingdom was there. The fulfillment of the promise, which is the first stage of where we are right now, where Jesus came, died, right? He, he lived a sinless life. He died. He resurrected from the dead. And when he resurrected, that's what allowed God to release the Holy Spirit. When Jesus brought the blood, the perfect sacrifice to the mercy seat of heaven, that completed it. And now Holy Spirit is released. And now we're in a very different dispensation. And then the final was the consummation of the promise, which will happen when Jesus has his final return. And some folks are hoping that happens right now before I'm done preaching. Hurry up, Jesus, and get us out of here. It's a mess. Well, it is a mess, but he's got us here for a reason. What's that reason? Occupy until he comes. Yeah, amen. amen. So three stages. Promise of the Old Testament. The fulfillment of the promise came when Jesus did the mission, and he accomplished the mission. But there's a final stage, the consummation, that hasn't happened yet, which is the second and final return. I will say the final return, whether you believe it's a second or third that's another day's topic, amen? I'll just say the final return is when this will be consummated, Revelation 21 and 22, it will come back to this earth, right? The new heaven, the new Jerusalem is coming back here. Okay. <laughs> so Dr. Ladd develops his thesis that the kingdom of God involves two great movements, Fulfillment within history, which Jesus did when he came, and then this piece, the consummation at the end of history. And that's what we await, that final return. And, and the Apostle Paul uh, speaks a lot about this, probably more than any other writer, about what it's going to be like when this final return happens. Um, was, when Trisha and I knew that we were going to be taking this assignment to start a church out here, there was probably six months to a year of planning before that happened. And I was really fortunate to be mentored by someone from the Vineyard Movement who served under John Wimber, who I'll get to in a minute. And, and I learned a lot in a very short amount of time about this whole kingdom philosophy that wasn't prevalent in my upbringing uh, as, as a Christian for the first 15 to 20 years. And I'm not going to overcomplicate it, but I'll, I'll just get to the point that this man that wrote the book that I already mentioned, The Presence of the Future, had great insight on the kingdom and understanding the gospel of the kingdom, not just the gospel of salvation, as important as salvation is, but also now to make the saints want to become disciples of Jesus, not just converts, not just I said yes and I, and I said a prayer so I know I'm going to heaven when I die, as great as that is, but what about the rest of our life here? What about occupy until I come? What about the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violence recoil and hide in the bunker? No, no, we're supposed to step up and say, let's be about the Father's business. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of the one who sent me. And the will of the one who sent him, he said, as the Father sent him, so he's sending us. So the same mission Jesus had, we're supposed to be on, which for nothing else should be the agape, unconditional love of God flowing through us. So as I said, Peter Wagner was there, another professor with Dr. Ladd, and then John Wimber was hired by Peter Wagner. John Wimber really didn't have the, the academic background to be a professor, but I'm going to show you a short video clip here in a minute, and, and Ken Fish, anybody remember Ken Fish when he came here to speak? So Ken Fish was a student at Fuller when Dr. Wagner and John Wimber were there, and in fact, he went from being a student who had been going to Princeton, he, he transferred out there, and then became the teaching assistant for the class that, that they were teaching together. Um, so John Wimber was more the practitioner, is the way you'll hear Ken Fish refer to it, meaning... Peter Wagner was getting the insight about what it meant to live in the kingdom, which is that we shouldn't just talk about it, but we should demonstrate it. And then John Wimber would actually demonstrate and start praying for the people in the, in the class. And they were PhD students that had come from all over the world to get their PhD, and they were getting delivered 
in the class, and they were getting healed. But Fuller didn't believe that Christians could have demons. So there was a communication problem here. What do you do when PhD students have demons coming out of them in the class, and you don't think Christians can have demons? Yeah, that's called cognitive dissonance. If you need a big word for that. Your view of reality has just been blown up. <laughs> so Ken Fish is one of the people, I'm just giving you a very short list here, but some of the people you might know who were influenced by this dynamic duo of Peter Wagner and John Wimber, especially John Wimber. Cheon was a student in this class I'll talk about. Lou Engel, Bill Johnson, Chuck Pierce, John Arnott, who was the pastor at Toronto during the Toronto Revival, which was a vineyard church under John Wimber when that all happened. Randy Clark, Heidi Baker, Mike Bickle. I mean, I could give you a two-hour list here. I won't. But it's important to know that what they found and talked about has changed the whole world. Okay? And it wasn't just because it was a class. It was because there was a demonstration of the power. The class they taught that Ken Fish was the TA, teaching assistant, and Cheon, among many others, was a student there to get the PhD. It was called MC510. Ray, could you just play the video? It's only it's less than a three minute video, but you'll get the you'll get the reason why I'm showing it in a minute. Well, that's right, because all of this was being done, as I said, under the auspices of C. Peter Wagner, and he was a professor in the, what was one what was at that time called the School of World Mission or SWIM, S W M, School of World Mission. But John Wimber was by far the, the most adept of the practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the MC510 class got underway, and that was just its course designator. It was a course on church growth, M for mission, C for church growth, 510 because it was a graduate level course. Um, and you know, so we met once a week in the evenings, and uh, John would lecture, and then we'd do clinic, and sometimes we'd get out of there pretty late. The real animus came from the School of Theology, SOT as they called it. Right. But but there was also pushback from the School of Psychology or the SOP. Right. And I think that these two sort of linked arms and they exerted their combined will and effectively got the 510 class, MC 510 class, shut down and driven from campus. Maybe it was three years or four years later, Peter just said, you know, I'd, I've had enough. And he left and started the Wagner uh, right. stuff that he was doing in Colorado. But it's so ironic that how circular it is, because you read the New Testament, the Pharisees couldn't understand what Jesus was doing. Instead of just accepting the miracles and realizing they had to shift their worldview, they want to kill him. You know, and here's yeah. the school of theology. It's happening right in their midst, and the only thing they can do is blame it on the devil. Meanwhile, people are getting healed, and they, can't, they have to ignore it and shut it down. And boy, if that's not something we're going to be accountable for when we get to the to the throne and, and here he's like, I'm demonstrating it right in your midst and you still can't accept it and you have to shut it down. But there were some really, I mean, truly amazing healings that happened in those classes while they were going on. And you know, John taught that class for, I can't remember now, but I think it was five years. And um, you know, there were just, there were amazing things. People with legs that were like this much too short, the leg would grow out and be healed. People who had cancer who got healed, blind people who got healed. I mean, there was no denying what was going on, and it was creating this stir, and it was so much of a thing that I don't know where it is, but somewhere in my files someplace I have a, an old magazine from Christian Life, and it had a light blue cover, and it was talking about signs and wonders in the seminary. And, man, this just made them all kinds of cranky, so you know, in the, in the School of Theology and the School of uh, Psychology. And so it just had to go. It didn't fit a lot of people's cessationist theology that they held and that, you know, they gotten it wherever they'd gotten it. Um, and in some ways, I think it, it was, I, I think in some ways all of this was serving to upstage maybe the preeminence of the theological faculty. And so with that, there was also a, I mean, I don't think anybody ever explicitly said this, but I, I mean, you could see what was happening. There was a sense of, we need to protect our turf. This is making us look bad. Uh, I just... I want to cry sometimes when I see that. This is making us look bad. It, you know, as soon as it comes becomes about me and my reputation, well, it's not happening in my class. I should just start going to that class. No, it's making us look bad. 
They're on the cover of a magazine and we're not. <laughs> so I'm just saying, like, if we think we wouldn't do this, we might have to think again. Because Jesus said, you missed your day of visitation, Jerusalem. I was here. I was the very one you were praying for. But because I didn't fit the mold, you rejected me. And look at Lonnie Frisbee, right? Look at that movie. I'm sure a lot of you know who he is now. You know, he, he was all part of this same time out in California, the, the Jesus People Movement. And, you know, they accepted him even though he was out of the box. And, you know, one of the best scenes in that movie for me, how many saw the movie? Right? The Jesus Revolution. You should see it. And it's when Kelsey Grammer, you know, the, the more famous actor uh, who's, who's playing the pastor of the church, confronts his church and says, this is the new group of people that are going to be in our church. So you have to make a decision. You can stay or go, but they're staying. <laughs> and that one older man got up and left, and then the other older man got up and walked and sat in the row with them and put his arm around and say, howdy, neighbor, kind of thing. See what we have to do? We have to recognize that God is bigger than we realize.